Hi, it's Jamie, Progressive's Employee of the Month, two months in a row. Leave a message at the... Hi, Jamie. It's me, Jamie. I just had a new idea for our song about the Name Your Price tool. So when it's like, tell us what you want to pay, hey, 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 and the trombone goes, blah, 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 and you say, we'll help you find coverage options to fit your budget. Then we just all do finger snaps while a choir goes, savings coming at ya, savings coming at ya. Yes? No? Maybe? Anyway, see your practice tonight. I got new lyrics for the rap break. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Damn You Hollywood, the show that uh, it just won't die. It just it won't go away. It's uh, you know I I don't know like a bad penny, like a rash, just never actually going away. Uh, I'm Robert Winfrey, and here with me is Mark Radlich, who I, I joke about illness, but who seems to be uh, coughing up a lung over there. Mark, you okay? Do we need to call a doctor? I mean, I live half, I live pretty much literally on the other side of the country, but... Are you a doctor? Well, I'm not a medical doctor. What kind of doctor are you? I'm a chiropractor. I'm kidding, are... I'm not. <laughs> like, are you really? I almost said dentist, because that's like the lowest form of, like, pseudo... <laughs> I have the, I have this on running gag with my one of my brothers about this because I and bear in mind that I know that the phrase doctor if you break it down to its Latin roots actually references teacher rather than physician I do know this but moving into contemporary society a doctor of medicine of some variety and then there's teachers who have doctorates and I always kind of get a laugh out of people with their doctorate who go no I am a doctor like okay can you save me from having a heart attack. I was no, uh, I'm a professor <clears throat> of economics. You're not a doctor. Shut up. I at one point was going to go back to school to get my doctorate in social work, um, and I told my dad my only reason for doing so was to have to make him call me doctor. You should have done it. You absolutely should do it. Yeah, I have. Uh, I, 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 again, having doctorates in in non I won't I don't want to say useless things because I razz my mom on occasion about her not getting her doctorate in speech language pathology. But having a having a non medical doctor, it just amuses me to no end. Because oh, I'm doctor so and so. Oh, what are your doctor of? You just have to like look at the ground, kind of shame faced, and answer the question. Yeah, I don't know what I would do with a doctorate in social work, considering you know my my my, my, my lifelong dream at this. Yeah, I'm not teaching. I've tried teaching social work once. It went poorly. I'm not doing it again. Um, hey, we watched a movie this past uh, weekend yes, slash Tuesday. This- this this episode of Damn You Hollywood, rather than Robert and Mark BS about their lives, we are reviewing M Night Shyamalan's latest feature, Glass, the the uh, final part of the Unbreakable trilogy. Nope. What? Nope. What do you mean, nope? It's the East Rail One Seven Seven trilogy, not the Unbreakable trilogy. How did you arrive at that? 
Glass, a 2019 American superhero thriller film written, produced, and directed by M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong. The film is a sequel to Shyamalan, Shyamalan Ding Dong's previous films <laughs> Unbreakable and Split, cumulatively forming the East Rail 177 trilogy. I was not aware that was the title of that particular thing. For those of you unfamiliar with that, with that uh, again, Shyamalan's second feature was Unbreakable, uh, which featured uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Bruce Willis. Uh, the sequel to that was, you know, several years later with Split, starring James McAvoy, who should have received some. Uh, for both that Oscar. movie and this one, he should have received some uh, some award love because uh, McAvoy's acting in Split was tremendous, and it's tremendous here. Like, I mean, it could easily be caricature because he has to go through so many different characters, but it actually works, and I think he he deserves a lot of credit for both of those movies. Truly, he's one of the for my in in my opinion, he's one of the few saving graces of Glass, but. We'll get there. But yes, East Rail 177 refers to the train that was derailed in Unbreakable, revealing that Bruce Willis is, the, is in fact the Unbreakable Man. Uh, it is also the same train... As long as, he, as long as he doesn't encounter water. What is it with Shyamalan and like, hey, the planet's 70% water. Let me keep creating these things that are vulnerable to it. Well, I mean, you just answered your own question. When there's 70% of something... Uh, around it, repre- you know, it represents a significant threat, don't you think? Well, I mean, you are like 70, 60 to seventy percent water. Yeah, but you I mean, and I are. You want to create an ever-present threat if you're going to, you know, if you're going to create one. Why not? Uh, you know, why not water? It's everywhere. It's easy. I mean, you don't want to overcomplicate this. And it's like, oh, you know, it has to be a specific type of wood. You know, I, it's then you have to find ways to get that in there. No, with water, water is everywhere. You're right. It rains. It, it collects in puddles. There's pools. Sure. So you're you're some you're now you are now an impotent individual if you happen to live in Florida where it rains frequently. No, instead he lives in dreary as fuck Philadelphia, where it also <laughs> rains frequently. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm je- I am for the first and last time in my life going to be jealous of people in the city of Philadelphia. Bill Cosby once referred to it as filthy Delphia, but why are you? Wh- why do you say such things? Because the UFC event in Philly got its main event over the last couple of days, and it's Edson Barboza versus Justin Gagey. Ah, violence! So right. much violence. Anyway, yes. Plot synopsis. Um, go. Okay, hang on. Hold on. Hold on. I no. Have to ask about, uh, no. No. no just, just hear me out. La la I'm la la. I'm curious la. about what. Hold on. I just have to ask, because you're not a fan of Shyamalan's work generally. Nope. What led you to putting this on? Was this just, we have to have a damn you Hollywood in the month of January, and this is the most interesting thing to me? No, I was, I mean, I was genuinely curious after the success of Split. Um, yeah, when the idea was thrown out there that he was going to create a third, that Split was connected to Unbreakable and was itself the second part of the East Rail 177 trilogy, uh, and that the next thing would be Glass, I was genuinely curious. I thought, look, I'm not going to... I'm not going to go ahead and say I don't like M. Night Shyamalan movies. I'm going to say I haven't liked his movies so far, most of them. I like The Sixth Sense. I didn't see Split, but I've heard it's good. I'd probably like it if I saw it. Uh, if I you probably would. Chance. It's a very it, it's similar to this in the sense that it's a very intimate movie, but it's also a lot more of McAvoy's acting. Yeah. Um, I actually oh, okay, I need to. I you know I mean the last I haven't seen Split the, necessarily. The last M the last M Airbender Lady in the oh. Water. I mean, I, though everyone says they suck. So what is there? To I don't talk think about Lady. There? I don't think Lady in the Water is as bad. A, I think it gets an unduly bad reputation. Rap. Uh, I've heard last the. Airbender I've heard so the visit bad. is great. Here, hang on, I have his. I have his filmography up. So, um, I saw the Sixth Sense that I liked. I I was in Stuart Little as an extra, believe it or not. But that's not one Wait. he directed. Yeah. Uh, I I don't enjoy Unbreakable. I think it sucks. Um, 
And for more on that, it, check out the latest wrong. on trial. I uh, haven't seen signs. I thought the village was okay. Everyone hates Lady in the Water, and I've heard, heard it's terrible. Um, I've never... Look, I don't know what do the happening watch... is. Oh, the happening is so bad. I mean, first of all, it stars Mark Wahlberg, so it can't be good. And then it's it's worse from there. Like, that is the... That is so bad. There's literally a scene where the characters try to outrun the wind. <laughs> the la- Speaking of which, the last airbender, from what I understand, is so bad it should be stu- studied. No, no. Um, this is this this goes beyond so bad it should be studied. This is so bad it should be forgotten. Uh, After Earth, I've heard, is terrible, and then the again, line, that After Earth came off as so much more of like just a vanity project for Will Smith. So everything from the Lady in the Water to After Earth is terrible, and then he comes back with the visit, which was good, from what I understand. Split was so good that it, you know that they green lighted glass, and here we have glass. And and here's what I'll tell you: I'm gonna try my my damnedest tonight to not give in to the same sort of forces that make us rip apart uh, movie reviewers in the third part of our program. I'm going to try to review the movie as fairly as I can and leave my personal opinion out of it. Because I do feel like there are some truly interesting and cinematic elements that are appreciable about this feature. I just fucking hated it. (laughs) You know? That is the difference. And I'm allowed to hate things. I'm allowed, you know, I, I don't really want to get into, you know, Mark versus Robert uh, round 10 that only, only Mark, you know, Mark only likes shiny things that blow up. I, it's not even about that. It's, yeah, I have my preferences, but I can recognize when something is, is well done. So there are, so that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to try to leave my personal opinions out of this. So you're doing what I normally try to do. And fail most, most times, but yes. In earnest, yes, I fail. My life is a failure. I'm used to it. <laughs> By contrast, I'm going to do what you what you normally try and fail to do. That's because... not true. I don't fail. I, you, I, I, can usually, I can usually excitedly and with a lot of passion describe what is good about a film and what I like about it. Yeah, so that's what I... Because fair, in, in full disclosure, I enjoyed this movie a fair bit. I you, also know there's a lot of there's a lot of it that isn't good. You you first of all, you are one of those people who I'm starting to realize really do enjoy a good gay cowboys eating pudding uh type of movie. So I'm not surprised that this boring piece of horse shit uh just tickled your bag. Having said that, I'm sure there's a lot of wonderful elements of this movie that we can talk about and enjoy. Yeah, uh, the supreme <laughs> irony of your joke there. I really don't like Brokeback Mountain. You know, every time I do the gay cowboys eating pudding thing, you remind you you say that. Like it's going to stop me from using the gay cowboys eating pudding line. I would like it to, because it was a stupid line when South Park did, made it. It's never going to happen. I know. All right, anyway, here comes your plot synopsis for those curious or worried about spoilers. Uh, we pick up with the ca- God. I'm just I don't know if I should call him the Beast or the Horde or just James McAvoy. The Horde is the collection of I would say the Horde if you're going to refer to his character because the Beast okay. is one specific personality. Yeah, the Beast is a personality. I mean, you could call him Kevin because that's the original personality. Well, in the in the wiki, it's James McAvoy as Kevin Wendell Crumb slash the Horde. Yeah, they actually... I love that. They credited him with all the individual characters that he played. That was great. Waka waka. Uh, I'll probably go back and forth between those two, but you'll know who I'm talking about. Uh, This picks up in the aftermath of Split, where he is, spoiler for that movie, largely successful in releasing the Beast and killing a bunch of people and going on a rampage. Uh, now he is still trying to do a lot of the same stuff. Uh, his, I, as I understand it, the basic premise of the beast is I'm going to show people that this, what the peak of human capability is. I believe he also punishes those those who he thinks are pure, but those who have been molested, he uh... yeah, he's got a thing about 
okay, people who have, like, not had to deal with a bunch of shit in their lives. Like, how dare you? How dare you have a good life? I will punish you for this. That sounds about right. Uh, but anyone who is broken, he is uh, their champion. He is trying to encourage them to rise up and show them what they're capable of, and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, he's kidnapped a bunch... The character has kidnapped a bunch of cheerleaders, and they're waiting for the beast to come out and kill and devour them, because he cannibalizes them. Uh, while that's going on, we have David Dunn, who is still being a low-level vigilante out in the world. Uh, he He breaks into the house of a couple of morons who... You know, like, jump people on the street for crappy YouTube videos. And he proceeds to beat the crap out of them, which I found deeply cathartic. But he is looking generally for the Beast, because he is super... He is, You know, he has super endurance, super strength, as long as he doesn't get splat... As long as he doesn't take a bath. I mean, he must reek. Uh, he is... Sorry, for those of you who don't know, his weakness... Uh, we referenced it earlier. His weakness is water. And he... <clears throat> but... So he's out looking for the beast. He's walking the areas in Philadelphia where the beast has attacked people. He's walking and, in London. Ban, da, 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 speaking Italian. Sorry. I don't even know the song you just sang, so... It's Walking in London by uh, Concrete Blonde. You and Jesse were not born in this country, I swear to God. I feel like every time, Look, I, every time I talk to both of you, I feel like I'm talking to Moscow on the Hudson. You just think that... You, you just don't think there's a world west of the Appalachians. <laughs> just like everyone who lives in California doesn't think there's anything east of the Rockies. <laughs> I mean, that cartoon from The New Yorker that shows, like, the New Yorker perspective on life, where it's just like, hey, here's New York, here's a bit of the coast, here's this great, great empty mass, Texas, maybe down here, and then California way over there. <laughs> that is accurate. Go on. Anyway, as he is looking for the beast, uh, he eventually finds him. We get a bit of a fight between the two of them, where they both get to show off a little bit of their superpowers before they are abducted by authorities and Dr. Staple. <laughs> God, it's like this guy writes with a 10th grade understanding of symbolism. Anyway, they are abducted by... Uh, arrested, not abducted. They're they're both criminals, though, technically speaking. <laughs> they're arrested, they're put in a psychiatric hospital, and are told that, I have, that this doctor has uh, three days to try and convince them that they're delusional and not actually super-powered. Or the moon will crash into the Earth. Uh, it, it, it's vague. At the time, like, this, I have three days and I'm going to do... And if I can't sell you in three days, well, boy, howdy, I can't sell you at all. Uh, so we get a few interactions between uh, the two of them. She's has a therapist... Because she's also the person who has taken over care of Elijah... What is his last name? Burke. Burke, thank you. No, that's not correct, sir. That's that. That's a character in in professional wrestling. It's Elijah Price. Price, okay. <laughs> really, there's an Elijah Burke. There was, and Sylvester Turkai. I remember Sylvester. Elijah Burke became the Pope. Dy Dynamite De Niro, or Dynamo De Niro, or Dog Dog Ear De Niro. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I remember him. He was in TNA for a while. Anyway, yes, that's when he was that's when he was dope faced in era. Anyway, uh, she's she's taking over care of uh, Elijah Price, and he is, of course, the super genius. <laughs> what? Wiley Coyote, super genius. I don't understand the reference there either, but okay. Really? What? what? You've made it a few times, but. I mean, I know who Wiley e. Coyote is. Yeah, Wiley. E. This isn't that difficult. Wiley e. Coyote says, "I I am Wiley e. Coyote, super genius." He's not always a mute character. Okay, I've I've missed that. I guess. All right. 
You've never heard him say Wiley e. Coyote Super Genius? No. I I feel like me, you, and Jesse have to do a podcast. Mark teaches you know, Mark teaches American culture. And culture. Oh, that, that, this would be Mark teaches East Coast culture. That's not an East Coast thing. Wiley e. Coyote was widely represented throughout the United States. What did you not have Looney Tunes in Europe? Not I... Europe, Utah. Thank you. First of all, I haven't lived in Utah my whole life. Second, yes, I've seen plenty of Looney Tunes. I've never seen the ones where he talks. Okay, well, I'm going to spam your Facebook page with talk- Talking Wiley Coyote when we're done here. I, 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 don't get me wrong, I know it's happened. I just don't recall ever seeing it, so... Anyway. Uh, so, her again, her whole thing is she's trying to convince these three people that they are normal, <laughs> essentially. That the beast is a product of both a deranged mind and an incredibly phys- gifted physical body. And seriously, credit to James McAvoy for his shoulders in this movie because, yes, how about, how about? she tries she tries to convince uh, David Dunn that he's just unbelievably perceptive. Like, no, you are the best mentalist ever on an unconscious level, which is so asinine. <laughs> Um, and Elijah's mostly doped out of his mind, or at least pretending to be for a lot of these early sessions, but she does succeed in getting the other two to kind of doubt, you know, am I really super powered or am I just extra, or am I just extraordinary, but within the bounds of generally accepted human capabilities, you know, the upper bound limit necessarily, but still human capabilities. Uh, we get some bits with some of the supporting characters. Uh, David's now grown son Joseph, played by the same actor who played him when he was in Unbreakable. So you know, kudos for continuity. Who tries to get his dad out and winds up having some doubts of his own. Uh, the girl who survived in Split, uh, Casey, and Elijah's mother. Who all kind of visit them on occasion and are just, you know, basically on their side out in the world so to speak and yeah, we it is revealed as the movie goes along through the course of this three day period that Elijah's been stealing his meds and not actually been sedated for a while now it's called cheeking there's a lot of ways to do it in his instance he, in his case he actually swaps out his meds like between guard shifts he swaps them for like aspirin or something so that he can just take them as much as he wants and not have to fake it, but he's not actually getting the medication they want him to get. Uh, he arranges a meeting with the Beast after talking with some of the other personalities so they can team up because he ostensibly wants the Beast and David to fight at the opening of the brand new Osaka Towers, which is a real marvel pun and fully intended, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, and again, the Beast wants to get the broken people of the world to rise up and wants to do so. So for now the, he needs publicity and a stage to do for it. For the on. meek shall inherit the earth. Okay. What? I mean, that's, that's, that's what he's inferring. <laughs> that's true. I, sorry, you brought up something interesting about the translation of that word from the original language into English, but. Meek, inherit, earth? Meek. Yeah. Like the line, it, again, it says, it is translated as the meek shall inherit, inherit the earth. The word in the original Aramaic or Hebrew, I can't remember if it's Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek that it was originally done in, my apologies. But it, it, the literal translation of the word that they translate to meek, because when you translate, you condense and whatnot, is, is not meek necessarily. It's those who have swords and know how to use them, but, will, but keep them sheathed, which is a. Uh, which carries a which I think is more accurate and you know, gives that whole phrase a slightly different twist. That is, uh, sorry, whole other thing. Anyway, again, that so he wants that, and Elijah wants David to fight. He, again, his whole thing is he wants to know how he fits into the world, and the existence of super powerful beings to kind of complement 
the fact that he is a genius but is, you know, Mr. Glass. Not just glass, like sugar glass. This dude is fragile. As fuck. And so he wants them to do this in public to kind of validate his view on the world. So he's encouraged. He encourages David to get out and then go fight the beast on you know, this very public stage. He helps the beast break out. David, utilizing his super power, his super strength and durability, does just kind of shoulder check his way through a giant steel door. They wind up clashing on the front lawn of the mental facility. They David overpowers a bunch of security guards and then locks them in a container and by bending a metal bar between theirs with his bare hands. Uh, the beast overpowers and kills several of them. Uh, they fight. The beast is about to win, but relents because he does want to do this on the biggest stage possible. So as he is escaping, uh, Casey grabs him to stop him and the relationship that Casey has established with a few of the different personalities including the primary one, Kevin uh, and her physical contact with him it's a bit overwhelming and he winds up uh, reverting to, again, his normal personality his original personality of Kevin After at which point he is shot fatally uh, <laughs> like by you, some of the police that show up like you do uh, David, while weakened after being thrown into a tub of water with a you know, massive tub of water with the beast, is then dragged over to a relatively deep pothole that is now full of water and drowned. And the beast turned on Elijah after it was revealed that, because and this has to get, uh, this goes a little bit into split, but the formation of the diff- of the dissociative identity disorder that goes on in David in not David in Kevin's head is that it was brought on by his mother being an abusive, sadistic person. The reason she was given free reign to abuse him all of his childhood was that his father died in a in a train crash that turns out to be the same train derailment that Elijah used to when searching for extraordinary people and revealed David being, you know, unbreakable. Uh, so he turns on him because in these types of stories, as was no- literally noted by one of the characters, when the two bad guys team up, the smart one always has some kind of key about the other one's past that he doesn't want to know. Uh, he so again, so the beast turns on him and winds up killing him very easily, in essence. Uh, so as Elijah's dying and David's being drowned by these people who share a club-shaped tattoo, and when I say club, I mean like the playing card club, not, you know, a truncheon. Uh, the doctor comes over and takes his hand, and one of David's other abilities is that if he touches someone, he's given sort of clairvoyance into their past. Uh, their, uh, you know, their, you know, the dark things that live in their soul. Yeah, he he is the shadow in that respect, I, I guess. He can see what crimes they've committed. Yeah, and as she, as they take hands, she he realizes that she is part of this secret society whose only purpose is to suppress the existence of superhumans. That they just don't want this the knowledge that this type of these types of people can exist in the world and do. And because soci- it's not fair, and society would crumble, and really we're just all about communism, and everything has to be equal. This includes all your physical abilities. I assume next on their hit list is the Olympics, because how dare Usain Bolt have all that running potential? <laughs> uh, she goes over to Elijah and tells him, "Take some solace in the fact that you know you were right, if nothing else." And please die peacefully and you know, Kevin dies in the arms of Casey turns out that uh, Elijah had played them all for fools and all the security cameras that were on that are all throughout this building had both been running this entire time and streaming all of everything that they had recorded to a private server that he then emails access to to uh, his mother Joseph and Casey after his, you know, again, he's died so this was all set up before he died and 
they decide to release all this information to the world. Dr. Staple realizes that all of the efforts that all these people have put in are just as essentially going to be destroyed. And the three essentially true main characters uh, sit around some station, some train station. I forget which one. I don't know what they all are. And just get to see people looking at all this at you know this footage and whatnot as in real time as it's released and remark that this is the begin this is how a universe gets started. And I glossed over a bunch of stuff because there's a lot of stuff that goes in that winds up being like contextual rather than just plot related, so that I do want to get to. But Mark, you said you hated this. Yeah, but that's not really what's important here. So what's what's good about this movie? Um it's pretty well performed. I mean, obviously, James McAvoy gives the best, most colorful, most energetic performance. Um, I, Samuel L. Jackson you know, can take plain speaking and make it entertaining just by uh, virtue of his charisma. So even though he does a lot of his dialogue looking dead-eyed at the camera, he he, he has a special way of doing it that, that's very unique to him. So he was kind of fun to watch for the most part on screen. Um, Bruce Willis uh, is okay. I mean, Bruce Willis obviously is not a bad actor, um, but this character that he plays in David is very meek and kind of mousy, despite you know those phenomenal things that he can do. And so he's about as interesting as dry toast um, in terms of, of, of a performance. But that's what Shyamalan apparently wanted out of him was, hey, could you be as as white as humanly possible and dry? It's really as – I think the problem was he wanted him to be as reluctant as possible. Yeah, well – Because comes... he, is the, he is the reluctant hero, but I think they took reluctance and dumbed it all the way down to – as uninteresting as possible. Well, you know, I said in Unbreakable that he's sad and dead-eyed. And he is sad in that movie. I mean, that's part of the fundamental premise of his character. Is this yeah. is a guy, but I don't think he's struggling got, with that. He's not much better in this movie. So there's that. Um, Sarah Paulson, I believe her name is. Uh, yeah, Sarah Paulson is Dr. Ellie Staple. Um, she does a really good job of playing a mental health professional. You know, she she comes really, across. Speaking of, because personally, speaking of dead eyed. <laughs> um, I mean, there, look, having trained in this professionally, I know that you know, you, like whenever I have to deal with a patient, especially one that you know has had to be forcibly removed from their housing unit, and I have to do an assessment. You know, there's things you do with your voice. There's a whole approach so that you come across as empathetic and not as attacking, especially in an environment, it's, which is important in an environment like mine when you're dealing with, uh, you know, people who can be very hostile or what have you. And I thought I mean, you deal with look, you deal with a lot of crazy people. There are a lot of angry people, that's for certain. Um, I deal with a lot of people who are de- who are coming off drugs, and so they're highly irritable, and you can't. You can't do what some of our nurses do, which is start yelling at them, um, you know, and what, frankly, what some of the de- detention deputies do, uh, which is a very, like, direct approach, you know, as the as the mental health professional, the idea is to get people to talk, you know, she's got these three individuals, the, the, the horde, the overseer, and Mr. Glass, and she is trying to get them to... Uh, divorce themselves from the premise that they are superheroes. You know, she's trying to attack, the, get them to attack their own delusions. You can't do that by yelling at them. <laughs> so I thought she, I thought she did a good job playing. Because I mean, you don't know that she's really an operative for uh, this group until the very end of the movie. Because you know, no, that's... no, there's a, there's a, there's a. I, fi- I can't remember exactly when. I, I think I suspected earlier. But as soon as they're they start fighting, and her call to the rest of to the staff is get everyone away from the south side windows. I went, okay, you're you're part of the cover up. I am just okay. Oh, thank you, Christopher Rattledge. I get that you you know you saw that coming, but it isn't revealed in the film until uh, David touches her. You know when he's about to be drowned. Drowned. I mean, unless you're not paying attention, it doesn't matter. 
We're talking about narratives right now, not, not you know, can you guess what happens next? So anyway, um, <laughs> so she, uh, up to the point, up to the point where she is revealed to be, you know, the true villain of this thing. She does a very good job of portraying herself as an empathetic mental health professional. That's where I was going with that. So, you know, let, let, let's, let's look at this on a checklist of boxes, right? You know, performances. Performances were very good. I, I don't have any so, objection, objections there. I mean, in fairness, like, even Bruce Willis, who is, you know, again, kind of uninteresting in a lot of respects, is still, Dead-eyed still, zombie. Do, still does a good job. And yes. again, if that's what they wanted out of him, he certainly delivered Dead-Eyed Zombie. Yes. Yes, I believe Shyamalan was going for Dead-Eyed Zombie and Bruce Willis delivered. So you can't really fault him for that. Yeah. Um, Shyamalan also... And again, I, I didn't see Split, but I can feel... I, I Just from the, some of the stills that I've seen, the commercials that I remember, Shyamalan has a real thing for dreariness. And, you know, he certainly was like, you know, here's Philadelphia is brought to you by Seattle. Kind of a look at no, things. No. Mark, that's just Philly. <laughs> Either way, you know, I've look I, as the show tells us, and I've seen in person, the sun does in fact shine in Philadelphia, but not in an Mike Shyamalan movie. Apparently, he only believes in you know in uh, dark, dark covered uh, skies, cloud, cloudy days. That's what he likes. So, um, from a cinematic standpoint, he does very interesting things with the camera. I don't particularly like it. I I don't enjoy the overuse of the close up, but it is an effect that he tends to employ with a plume. You know, he it's just all over the fucking place. Um, it does give you a sense of claustrophobia. Uh, it it does heighten the eeriness and the tension of the movie, which is you know since this is supposed to be a suspense thriller of sorts. Uh, is really, you know is what you should be trying to achieve. Um, he makes very good use of the camera that way, and I think glass. Is, I think glass effectively does that. I think, you know, while while I was struggling with it, I think for the most part, you know, there was, there was a large portion of the audience got what he was going for, and it was effective. Um, it, does this work as a parable about superhero? T- you know, I, I brought this up in the on trial on Unbreakable, and I did so in a really silly way, but you know, because I, I, because that's just me for you. But he's trying to comment on the modern superhero film, even in two thousand, before we really got going in earnest with, you know, where we are today, which was you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe and how it's affected everything around it. Um. He was still commenting on superhero movies to the point up. where an undeserving movie is now nominated for best picture because superheroes and black people. Um, so I mean, so what's he? So what's he commenting on? He's commenting on the Michael Keaton Batman's. He's commenting. I mean, it's too. It, he can't be commenting on the X Men movies. Those were contemporary. Spider Man's the Spider Man movies hadn't come out yet. Uh, so you know, you take those out. So again, what's he commenting on? The Michael Keaton Batman's. The, uh, the the Supermans of the seventies and the early eighties. He's commenting on um, you know some of the other. I, lef- I think it, it in reference specifically to Unbreakable. I think he's also touching on comic books more so than comic book movies in a lot of respects. He is using the medium of film. Yeah, I agree. But a lot of what he touches on is stuff that you know the, again in the intervening years has been adapted but at the right. time was still just sitting on a shelf yeah you're absolutely right 100 percent. let me walk this back a little bit unbreakable is a commentary on the com- on the paper comic book structure uh specifically the origin story uh how how in comic books you have a human torch and a mr freeze and they're working opposite one another i understand i what i just did there but i'm trying to just give an example fuck off um, I know. was not going to comment on that. I knew what you were doing. I, I, com- <laughs> no, I completely get what, no, because you're just talking about how you get one guy at one end of the spectrum and right. one guy at the other. Someone actually commented about this, about how in, how in a lot of the Marvel movies, you have, you have a hero with an established set of powers and a villain with the same set of powers. And that goes on for a while. You know, you have Still Hulk is. and the Abomination. You have Iron Man and Iron Monger. Um... A different set of films and well before all of that but Spider-Man and Venom 
you know, and someone someone commented that, that, that they were getting tired of Marvel having of Marvel villains having the same exact power set as the as the hero. Um, Fair complaint. I mean, especially <laughs> if you really think about it. Like, when was the last time you saw a Marvel, especially a debut movie, mm-hmm. that the hero was not facing someone with basically their power set up? Yeah, it's you know you could you can you can talk about Thor and Loki being more of a yin and yang than than a uh, a mirror image of one another, but that's fair. Yeah, but that's about it. Yeah, um, I mean the Red Skull doesn't really have a power set. He's just a he's no, just a Nazi is, zombie. No, the Red Skull is just is another super soldier. There you go. Um, and that's literally how he's created. He's a di- he's an earlier batch of the serum that wasn't perfected yet. Okay. So he literally has the same powers as yeah. <laughs> Captain America. Moving on. Um, so where I was going with this, uh, you know, where Unbreakable is commenting on comic book structures, and to one degree or another, you know, doing so in a uh, sub subversive way, doing so in a um, the antithesis of bombastic. You know, if the modern superhero movie, even up to that time, was you know was something that was supposed to be, or even the modern comic book, which is supposed to you know jump off the page and be fantastic and take you to an otherworldly place, he he grounds his in reality. I mean, he he he's sort of the the forerunner to the gritty fucking Netflix version, uh, you know, or the Chris Nolan Batman. Of its of its time, you know, he's looking at what happens when normal people in a normal universe that operates on the, with the same physics that we know and love in our world suddenly has super pe- super powered people in it. What happens? Um, whether or not that's successful, kind of is is individualized to your own you know take on the movie. Um, Glass is supposed to be that continued conversation about. What is, what you know, what what is the comic book structure? And um, the problem is, I I don't think the I don't think that Glass took the conversation any further than Unbreakable did. Um, Elijah Price, Mister Glass, t- makes a lot of the same points over and over again that he made in Unbreakable, at least as that I can recall. I don't. No, there's a, there's a fair bit of repetition there. He does not, and in minor fairness to this point, what as a char- bear in mind, not as a not from a writing standpoint, because I agree there's things that could have been done better on the mo- in the movie as a whole. But I mean, he him as a character is not. He hasn't really changed. No, you know, his, but that's the thing. His worldview like, is still the same. It's like it's, I think that's my 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 one objective problem with Glass is if you're going to do another one of these movies you'd have to do something else with the conversation you started he made his he made well enough points in Unbreakable good bad or indifferent whether you like the movie or not there's a there's a stated opinion about comic books in Unbreakable it's there it's there for you to chew on it's grist for the mill he does. He doesn't take it any further in glass. It's the same exact point. The only thing that happens in glass that's different from Unbreakable is, you know, at the end of Unbreakable, he the big twist is he revealed that he derailed the train. You know, he burned down the haystack to find the needle, as I said on on, on trial. And well, in, in fairness, and, that is a really good way to do it. And in glass. It's a bigger haystack, but the, but the same effect. He burned down yet another haystack in order for the, in order for the world to see the needles. Okay, that's all that was accomplished with this movie, and so on a personal level, I don't feel like there's enough narrative happening in this movie to warrant an, to warrant an entire feature. I felt that. Personally, it was a very hollow film and a, and a very uninteresting narrative. But that goes to the fact that he doesn't accomplish any... It's like, it's essentially he wrote this like one-act play in Unbreakable and someone said, how about we make it a full-on Broadway musical? 
the same fucking story, though. You know what I mean? It, it's it's. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I don't feel like Glass did anything differently than Unbreakable did. It just did it in a grander fashion. I think there's some truth to that. I think, I think part of the issue is that you need. I don't mean you specifically here, mind you. I think this is the general you, not the specific you. I think it is important to consider this as a continuation of that story. His goal was to both find his place in the world and once he realized you know, what it was, what people are capable of, so to speak, to then show it to the broader world. The only part of that that he accomplished, I mean, really accomplished, was figuring out that I'm not a mistake. Right. That there is a... But he did that in Unbreakable. That's what I meant. In Unbreakable, that's all he accomplishes. And then, you know, David goes on to continue working quietly in the shadows, and no one really pays attention. So the entire second half of his stated goal goes unfulfilled as of Unbreakable's conclusion. This is the continuation of that same essential, again, plan and goal from his perspective. It's... And, again, I get what you're saying, and I don't think it was... I think it could have been conveyed better. But part of the reason he doesn't... that It feels like he doesn't necessarily accomplish anything different is that it's still the same plan, he just only accomplished half of it to begin with. This is simply the act- the finishing of that stated goal set rather than the adoption of a new one. So I'm it also- does feel very samey. Okay. I also don't like the idea of thinking oh. that somebody with disassociative identity disorder has a superpower. He's a survivor of trauma. I'm assuming sexual trauma. And, you know, the brain with disassociative uh, identity disorder and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, the brain essentially, in order to save itself from the trauma being inflicted on it, will create all kinds of defenses. It, com- it comes out in different ways. Uh, flashbacks, d- multitude of identities, etc. I'm not an expert in, in this. I've studied it enough to be able to deal with what I have to deal with in my own job. Um, there's tons of readings on this stuff. The point being that the brain is resilient and... Um, but in doing so, it creates these disorders in order to deal with, with, with the greater trauma. That's not a fucking superpower. Okay, if I may, that is somewhat addressed in Split. His, his superpower is not his disorder. Okay. It's, it's his ability to like somewhat physically change. I think he can't... I, I, I'll, I'll go along with this for the ride here. I believe it's dressed, even in, the, in Glass, that he, is, he has a physiological change where he becomes, to a degree, invulnerable and super strong when he becomes the Beast. Yeah, the, if memory serves, and again, it's been a while since I've seen Split, and I've seen it piecemeal, not in one sitting, so forgive me for potentially mischaracterizing this, because I, I've beat that same drum with you. Like... <laughs> Mental, a mental disability or autism is not a superpower, right. guys. Yeah, CR, CR review of The Predator. Yeah. Just not a superpower. Having autism doesn't make you a hacker. No. What, what goes on with him is... It's less to do with the fact that you know, his... Again, it's not about his trauma. It's about... Elem- I think it is... The trauma was not... He's not that way because he was traumatized. It's more that that allowed... That was a... That was This mutant ability to come out? Yeah, it was was one gateway to this path where the brain is so powerful that if you... you It's it's able to alter his physiology. I will withdraw my previous comments then. It, it, It... I get what you're it, saying, it, and it explains it well is enough. If I believe, it's basically if I believe hard enough. Mm-hmm. And that, 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 that sounds a little bit demeaning, because you know, true belief is actually one of the hardest things in the world. But his, you know, the brain is so powerful that it can neurochemically alter your physiology. Yeah. I, and I'll that's with, what he does. I'll withdraw that complaint. It just... 
I don't know. It came across as a little silly to me. If you, if you haven't seen Split, I mm-hmm. completely get where you're coming from with that because it does that. Okay. That is kind of what it feels like. But there's a, but there are conversations in Split that do that specifically address all of that. Okay. Well, that does bring up an, it does bring up one point is that if you haven't seen Split, movies should be able to stand on their own. It's something we talk about with a lot of the great trilogies of our time. You know, does Return of the Jedi stand on its own as an individual movie if you haven't no. seen A New Hope? And that's a problem with Return of the Jedi. Does Return of the King stand on its own as its own, as its own movie if you haven't seen Fellowship or The Two Towers? Largely, yes. Largely, yes. And, you know, and that... But again, in, cr- in critical film analysis and review, that is one of the elements we need to examine. Can this film stand on its own without having to reference the other films? You just saw a great case of me fucking up a film review because I haven't seen Split, which goes to the writing and lack thereof in Glass. No, Glass absolutely does not hold your hand if you haven't seen the other movies, and I agree that can be off. that is off-putting. Um... Lastly, I, mean, I don't have a whole. Uh, as again, as far as critical analysis and film review of of an objective nature, I don't have a tremendous amount more to say. Um, it felt a bit. I, I said it felt a bit hollow. I don't feel like it reaches far enough. I don't feel like it goes deep enough. I don't they feel like it says anything about the nature of comic books that wasn't already said in a previous film. Um, it doesn't stand on its own. The performances are good. Uh, for, for the most part, the cinematography is fine. If you were going for dreary, um, and, in fairness, I think he is. Yeah, no, I and it, yeah, I, I can't argue with the guy's vision, uh, even if it's not particularly appealing to me. And then, so that's really yeah, that's all I have to say about it. All right, um, personally, did I? Did, I agree did, with. Hang on, did I do a good job of being objective? Yes. Thank you. More people should, again, a lot more people should. Again, I do want to have a because you, you know, you talked about what you, your issues were objectively. Then you said at the end, okay, here's why I personally have issues with it. That, that's how that should be structured, is my belief. That's why again, when I do this, I try to do this, basically what you did. I, I try to go, okay, here's my problem. Here's what I think structurally. Here's what I think works. Here's what I think does it. Here's why I like or dislike it. Because it allows you know, for the appropriate separation of those two things. Because I enjoyed this movie, and I don't have any issues with anything you said critically. I don't... I feel like there is... And this, might, this is actually part of something of a... It's a crying shame. Maybe not crying, but it is a shame that... As comic book movies were just starting to take off, that's when they got, we got the Watchmen adaptation... Because comic book movies now, as, and bear in mind, I, I will specifically cite the MCU because the DCEU is barely a thing, uh, from a narrative perspective at least. I mean, it exists, there are movies, Aquaman just made a billion dollars. So it's not going anywhere necessarily, but it's not coherent. Uh, or cohesive. I mean, we're not even sure Henry Cavill is still Superman or not. We don't know if Ben Affleck is still Batman. Like, there's a, there's too much confusion there. Whereas at the moment, the MCU is stable. I say at the moment because this time next year, I'm not so sure, but we'll see. And given the massive success, they comic book movies as such are ripe for a good deconstruction. And Watchmen, very famously deconstructed the superhero genre in you know comic form and then I, I mean I actually like the Watchmen movie I'm, I'm probably in the minority there but I did enjoy that movie a great deal and it's it's again it's just kind of a shame that we're not going to get some adaptation of that that really tackles you know, the you know, now that we've got you know comic book movies that are Commercially successful, critically successful. Hang on, let me and jump in here. We don't know what we're going to get with the HBO series. Also true. A deconstruction of Game of Thrones, where everyone lives happily ever after. <sighs> Which, I mean, game, bear in mind, Game of Thrones in and of itself is a really interesting deconstruction of a lot of fantasy to begin with. So, Everybody fucks on that show. Everybody. Yes. Everybody fucks everybody. 
Yes, this includes brothers and sisters. Yep, that's my takeaway. I'm smart. Go on. Well, look, we know why you watch the, mo- the show, at least. Boobies! <laughs> that's all it takes. <laughs> it's all that's needed. That's why Mark's getting back into professional wrestling, because they showed Alexa Bliss topless. <laughs> I, that was, nope, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> it, it's technically what happened, but it's horribly misleading. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm saying I didn't. I'm not watching Raw because you. I've I've heard about Alexis Bliss topless, but I'm good with just uh, videos on on YouTube. Go on. All right. So the point being, I definitely feel there was a much deeper conversation or discussion that could have been had around these same topics that this movie doesn't really dive into. And it's it's kind of a shame because it it was well positioned to do that. It just didn't for whatever reason. Uh, I I wish they would have done more with the interjecting of doubt because I think there was a sense of there's I feel like there should have been more time spent kind of with okay are these you know are they you know okay. Elijah, genius. There's a lot of geniuses. You know, uh, the Beast does some pretty crazy stuff. You know, does some very upper echelon human stuff. But that's not the same as superhuman. You know, I I would have liked more of a slightly greater discussion and a bit of paranoia and doubt about, you know, okay, well, wait, what have we really seen? And can we explain it away? Because that is, in many respects, this, that is what should have been, in a lot of respects, the central kind of crux of this movie is, well, wait, are they or aren't they? And they were. it was well positioned to have... I think it's kind of a shame they never had a real discussion between the Doctor and Elijah. Because there you have the person desperately trying to convince these you know these people that they're not spectacular that they're not super either for her established reasons of simply wanting to make this her field of study or for the actual reason of if they're if they're del- if they can believe they're delusional we don't have to kill them against the true believer the guy who knows like no this i know my pla- i have learned my place in the world I have learned, you know, I have seen the hidden truth of the universe in some respects, and you're not really going to dissuade me from this because you can't. I mean, he had one of my favorite lines from this movie when he's talking with uh, one of the identities, it might have been Patricia, uh, within James McAvoy's character, and he just says, everything extraordinary can be explained with science. That doesn't mean it's not true. Mm-hmm. Which is a is a profoundly brilliant line in a lot of respects, and I think I, I'm sad they never got to have that conversation between the two of them. Because is it just I, me? Or does M Night Shyamalan have a you know have good intentions, but he's kind of a shit director in that he can't follow through on those intentions. It's like he I, I feel just watching a couple of his movies and him kind of batting about maybe 50%, maybe less, that he... I think... There's something he, There's something good there, but he's on. not quite the guy to get to it. I was going to say, I feel like he'd have been better off as sort of a writer and producer, and he needs a director to bring about that vision. Like he, it, I feel like he's in that George Lucas camp of guys with great ideas awesome imaginations who need people to execute their visions for them because they can't do it. These are people that need editing. They need people around them that they can give give tasks to to bring about their vision. Because when they do it, they're not competent enough to see it through to its fullest potential. That's probably about that's probably relatively fair. Um, okay, what else? Because there were things again. I, if you, uh, I say this about this movie because you know some people have pointed out how telegraphed, you know this the plot points are. 
I mean, telegraphing is an insult. These are like smoke signals. <laughs> like, if you don't, I, like I said, as if you don't see everything in this movie coming, it just means you're not paying attention. And I don't mean that in some, like, you know, detail way, because I am I'm a stickler for details and thinking things through like that. I mean, you're literally, like, not paying attention to the fact that they're referencing comic books all the time. So, of course, they're going to follow this very specific structure with, you know, the turn and the, you know, the gathering of characters. The de- like, again, if you don't see it coming, it's literally because you're not paying attention. And if it's that telegraphed, I can't help but feel like it's intentional to, in some respects. So I, again, I enjoyed this movie a lot. I think it doesn't mean there aren't things that couldn't have been do- been done better, because very clearly there could have been, I think. But, you know, for what it was, I, again, I, I enjoyed myself for the two hours I was there. More so than at a lot of other movies. I did not. I feel like you know you're you're always finding a way to make me feel the suffering that I make you feel with, with movies. And I'll tell you, though this was not intentional, I was hoisted by my own petard. Um, the, the the experience I had with this movie was boredom, uh, hatred. I wanted to throw things at the screen at times. I walked out during the scene. Where young Samuel, young Elijah Price is on the is on the ride, and you know you, he uh, he loses his protections, and so he starts to hurt himself unintentionally. But I, I, it was that was this is a very very personal thing for me. I can't watch children get hurt like that. It was unbearable, and I needed to leave. And I, I went and got popcorn, I think, or some or whatever. I came back when I when I knew the scene was over. Now, that's fair. I, I mean, like, like whatever gets your go personally is whatever gets your go personally. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't need to get into it any further than that. It was, I, it was one of those where, you know, like, yeah. Well, oh, what, this this poor eight year old with horrible brittle bone disease is about to board a ride that's probably going to jostle him about. <laughs> <laughs> this seems like a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we watched Saw, and those, you know, Saw. I would avert my eyes, but I never, I didn't feel. Uh, emotionally compelled to leave the theater because it was too because the pain of what these people were suffering was too much for my own person to bear. That was, you know, with Saw it was like this is gross. I don't want to watch it, but I can listen to it just fine, and I have absolutely no affection for these people. I felt bad for that kid, you know, and you know, I, well, I, felt... I mean, he's a tragic character, yeah, in a, in a lot of ways, and. You know, scenes like that just kind of drive it home that, yeah, he's not a good guy. But you know, there aren't there aren't really, you know, I mean, there's a reason he is the way he is. Mm-hmm. And you know, which is, in fairness, a mark of good character writing that they're understandable, if not relatable. Are we, uh, we ready to move on here? Uh, let me think. Is there anything else I wanted to touch on? Um, again, this is a divisive movie, but again, I enjoyed it. I think a lot of it, a lot of this is going to come down to whether or not you enjoy this type of film. Because if you do, it's flawed. Um, again, I'm, there's certainly things about this I'm not defending. I agree with you that it feels a little bit shallow. Like there's more there that they never really get down into. I'm not sure if it's overwritten or underwritten in certain portions of this movie because there's just parts of it that like I wanted different stuff I feel like maybe we spend too much time with the orderlies yeah for reasons that are never made entirely clear well you know I kept thinking about while I was watching this um, Kill Bill and uh, you know when she's catatonic and you know the orderly the orderly there taking care of her is an utter piece of shit you know it's just like he's just he's so gone out Quentin Tarantino went out of his way to draw him 
as a contemptible human being so that when he gets his later, nobody feels sympathetic for him. And it was like, uh, okay, so these orderlies are not going to make it very long. You know, you, ha- you have to kind of set them up in a certain way. Because, like, if you don't establish that the one guy's a talker, then the whole bit where, you know, where no, 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 that scene I was him. fine with, like when he stops and starts talking with the guy about his essential oils collection, and I know, I know right, people like I'm that. I is, want to kill them. But what I'm saying is, like that was all you needed. All the other stuff having to do with that character, you didn't need any of it to. to you, you can get to the same place a lot quicker with that character yeah. than they did, and I feel like that's one of the. Fl- this is what I mean when I know when I say these guys need editing. You know, you need somebody that. It's one of the first rules of writing. Kill your darlings. And I feel yeah. like guys like Shyamalan and uh, George Lucas, they don't know how to do that, and they've earned so much cachet in Hollywood, they don't have to. But then they produce garbage. So, you know, they, 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 sometimes you need somebody there to say, you, you have drawn this long line that goes, that, you know, that goes to the same place you could get to with a shorter line. We're going to go with the shorter line. Um, yeah. And, again, you could have, so consequently, you could have filled that with some other stuff. But, again, on the whole, I found it enjoyable. I like James McAvoy's acting. I like Samuel L. Jackson. I mean, his the fact that at the end, when he gets into his, you know, his stuff that they you know brought him in with, he's got the coat, and he actually has a tie pin that is MG. <sighs> uh, it is... It, it is uh, it's over the top in some respects, but it's also like gloriously in character for a guy who is trying to bring a comic book ver- like comic books to life essentially. Like, of course he'd do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, ready? Yeah, I think that's it for this. So we should be moving on to the money. Mark's favorite thing. He's gonna hate this movie because it made money. Here we go. Money talk. Here comes the money. Money, money, money. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I didn't realize you were going. You you were going into a bit. Yeah, um, don't worry about it. <laughs> I got a. Don't get me wrong. I have a. Uh, I, I feel like I should warn you about this. I have a gimmick that I'm working on. That Normally is going to directly know. impact you. I was going to say the one where you continue to talk even past the, you know, an appropriate place to stop to, to accuse me to do the next thing. No, no, no. I'm, I'm working on cutting that one out because that's annoying. But no, I've got one that I'm I, I genuinely have something I'm doing right now that is going to directly. And it, I don't think it has yet, but uh, it's going to hit you and it's going <laughs> to it's going to be amusing when it does. So I need, I need to curry some good favor. Whatevs. Uh, the production budget on this thing was twenty million. It's already done fine. It's 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 making it's made a hundred million dollars worldwide, which means you know come March it'll be forgotten about in terms of money. But for the time being, for Universal, it's it a is place. the highest grossing movie released in two thousand nineteen so far. It's the short. It's the tallest midget. Is what it is. I am aware, but it is still the tallest midget. Uh, so it's fine. It's you know Universal is is kicking off 2019 with a solid with, you know, with a solid effort. Uh, they are currently not the most laughable studio on the planet for the year 2019. Good for them. Um, It'll I be just, Sony by the end of things. I just want to go ahead and revisit 2018 for just a moment. Um, you can pretty much take these to the bank in terms of this is where this is this is where the year is going to end, and it's not getting much better than this. Uh, obviously, the top four didn't change pretty much since the summer. It was Avengers, Black Panther, Jurassic World, and Incredibles. Aquaman rose to number five. It's it made over a billion dollars. I think it's just about finishing its run at this point, or it will be shortly. And then it'll be released in India and make another thirty million. Um, Venom came up behind it, and it has already been greenlit for a sequel. At number six, Bohemian Rhapsody, almost eight hundred million. It, you know, it might. They've released a version of it where it's a sing along. I thought about taking my daughter to, and then I was, I was told to decide against it. 
Uh, so we might watch that. Yes, one at by home. all means, take your daughter to watch to the theater to watch a bunch of Queen fanatics go to a sing along. That why would why would you think taking an eight year old to that is a good idea? She likes to sing. Uh, I, I'm not saying. <laughs> That's really. Saying, no, no, I didn't no. think about it much more than that. It's like, oh, she can. No, it's a queen, it, and again, uh, at its surface, like, oh, it's a queen sing along. My kid likes to sing. This will be fun. She can actually talk in the theater, and no one yeah. will yell at her. Right. Oh wait, it's a queen biopic. It's a biopic on Freddie Mercury. Right. I'm gonna. I, I wonder what types of people will be there. <laughs> I don't worry about that. Um. So, yeah, we'll, we'll watch that one at home. Anyway, Mission Impossible, number eight. Uh, that's already been greenlit for, I think, two more sequels. Hooray, huzzah. Deadpool God, 2 I, came... Uh, was why. <laughs> ...was knocked out in number nine, and the latest news on Deadpool is that the X-Force film has been killed, but Deadpool 3 Good. is currently in pre-production. Um, eh, I can... I don't, I don't want to see X-Force. I don't want to see Deadpool 3, but of the two options, mm-hmm. I think Deadpool 3 is probably preferable. Uh, Fantastic Beast fell to number ten, and and uh, the second, the third part to the Fantastic Beast trilogy has been delayed. So who knows when they're going to be working on that again? Ant Man and the Wasp actually got knocked out of the top ten because of some of these other films. Shame and... because Ant Man and the Wasp is pretty good. <laughs> You're an asshole. Um... What? <laughs> we got into such an argument over that. Yeah, I couldn't. I didn't think you were being serious. Again, it has plenty of problems, but I think it's go a better. Back, no, movie. no, no! Fuck you! Go back and listen to some of the stuff you said about that movie. You were so negative. Um, because trees, you were so positive. The trees around you died. Okay, you could actually you could actually see the, the leaking sap. You were so negative. God, that um, would have been nice. I've got at least one in my neighbor's yard. I would love to kill. Uh, Last about last thing about uh, 2019, Bumblebee, which on a 135 million dollar production budget has gotten to about uh, almost 500 million worldwide. Uh, whether or not this sparks a second Bumblebee single feature, or uh, they continue to, to uh, they continue with the ideas of doing an Optimus Prime movie, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure where they're going with this. Neither are um, they. But. Uh, <sighs> okay, they're part of uh, they're part of Hasbro. Uh, which is, is it Hasbro that has the, the it's got their own studio now, or is it Mattel? I think it's Mattel. I think it was Mattel. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the people at uh, Hasbro and Paramount are doing at this point. Look, they signed they, they signed the rights to this over to Michael Bay and Platinum Dunes. Mm-hmm. They so. don't know what they're doing. None of them. <laughs> So we'll uh, we'll end up seeing where the Transformers go from here, but they're certainly they are certainly here to stay for the time being, as Bumblebee is a relatively uh, phenomenal success. All right, to 2019 we go. This is going to be a lot of dog shit, so bear with me here. Uh, your world, your the highest grossing movie worldwide is currently Glass at number one with a hundred million. At 88 million is Dragon Ball Super Broly. Then escape room. Then the upside at a dog's way home. How to Train Your Dragon is out. Uh, is out in the world. However, it's not out in the United States just yet. But it has made twenty nine million dollars. Then replica. Then Yuri. And the kid who would be king. And then finally, Perfect Strangers. Because nothing's going to stop us now. Um, honestly, it's Jan. It's it, it, we're in fuck you. It's January. None of that matters. Uh, as far as the weekend goes, first week of. Uh, sorry, the week of January that this all occurred. Uh, Glass was your number one movie, obviously. The Upside fell from one to two. That's the one with uh, Brian Cranston and what's his face? <coughs> uh, Aquaman. I'm not fell, helping you out on that. Aquaman fell. Kevin Hart. Aquaman fell from two to three. Dragon Ball Z uh, Super Broly. Debuted at number four. Spider Man Into the Spider Verse fell to number five, and apparently has been nominated for an Oscar. Uh, Best animated picture. A Dog's Way Home fell from three to six. Mary Poppins Returns six to seven, which my kids enjoyed, by the way. Hey, can, can we just say briefly about the Oscars this season? They're pretty much desperately going, please, please watch us, so we'll nominate popular movies instead of crap no one's seen that's better. Yeah, oh, well, I'm not still not going to, going to watch the Oscars. I'm not watching them either, but I'm just saying, like, the, if you look at the list of nominations, there's very clearly a bit of, oh crap, our ratings are down. Mm-hmm. It's almost like people don't like listening to actors speak. 
<laughs> when they're not acting, because no one actually does. We don't actually have a host, because we gave in to crappy Twitter outrage, outrage over Kevin Hart. Yeah. He made stand-up jokes five years ago. Good God, we can't let this stand. And so they're like, okay, so we'll nominate Black Panther. That'll be our piecemeal for running a black man out of hosting the Oscars. <laughs> um, Escape Room fell from five to eight. Bumblebee, seven to nine. And on the basis of sex, which I saw and quite enjoyed, as a matter of fact. I don't know how you could have possibly enjoyed that movie. I, I was entertained. Felicity Fuckface was actually... Jones. You know, thank you. Felicity Jones actually gave a enjoyable performance. Oh, she's I'm, a good actress. Felicity Jones is a very good actress. Yeah, e- even though, you know... I mean, granted, she she, she wasn't in Rogue One, but... you know, yeah, she, she did, was. Just not, it, that, she wasn't written well. They just gave, gave her nothing to work with. Um, let's just get this over with, shall we? Uh... She's fine, you know, and I, I look. I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm not going to apologize for enjoying, you know, for enjoying a piece of liberal propaganda. It's not like I suddenly changed my opinion on, you know, on a, on a multitude of political subjects. I'm Ruth a, Bader Ginsburg being just one of the worst justices in Supreme Court history. I don't care. I wasn't going there to cast a vote. I was going to watch a film with my AMC A A list. Okay, go fuck yourselves. All right. Uh, I'm glad you had fun. Thank you. <sighs> and I think we're done here with the money. Um, as far it's as January, the little... there's not a lot of it. Uh, this Friday is the kid would be king and Serenity. I mean, eh. <laughs> then there's Miss Bala. Eh. Um, God, I saw a preview for that and went, "Who thought this was a good idea?" It's. I'm sure it's got a market out there, but I mean, these are going to be widely forgotten. I can't forgotten. imagine what it is. I know. I genuinely cannot imagine the argument, the 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 uh, the audience for that movie based on the trailer I saw. Um. Uh, excuse me. And then February eighth, there's Cold Pursuit, which is the new Liam Nielsen movie. <laughs> that looks so stupid. I can't wait. Yeah. The Lego Movie Part 2, which I'm sure will win the weekend. The Prodigy, which is the creepy kid, the latest creepy kid picture. And then, do you remember a Mel Gibson movie from years ago called What Women Want? Do I you? Do. Well, here's Tariji Parigi Cookie from, uh, I, from Empire doing the Mel Gibson thing in What Men Want. Have fun, okay. everyone. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's do a couple of things about this, just about that movie specifically. First of all, yes, What Women Want was, again, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. It's Mel Gibson, Helen Hunt. Um, I want to say, like, Kristen Stewart plays his daughter in that. It's like, y- child. Child, it's like, y- years ago. And it's about a guy who gets struck by lightning and wakes up with the ability to hear the thoughts of women. And... It's played for laughs. It's played for a bit of romance. It's a it's a crappy rom com from the nineties. What do you want? But it is at least based on the premise that women think interesting things, which is true more often than not. I would imagine. I have no earthly idea who thought, "Hey, you know, it would be funny if a woman could hear what goes through a man's head." Tits, 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 and vagina. Tits, 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 and vagina. Now I'm hungry. You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that's what kills me. Like, I saw the trailer for that movie, like, for What Men Want. Like, oh, it's a woman at a sports agency. Oh, how daring. And, oh, no, she can't get ahead because it's a boys club. Clearly hearing what men think is going to help her get it. No. Guys mostly say what we think, and if we don't say it, you really don't want to hear it. Yeah. We're not that complicated, people. Um, uh, so, but, again, the, the notion that this would be funny to me is... I, why, like, who would... Like, only men think what other men think is funny. <laughs> like, no women are going to go to this and feel good about the experience. So, that said... Uh, February 13th is Happy Death Day to You... Too. Oh, I'm so I, I'm so torn on that movie because it's it looks terrible, mm. but it might be the kind of terrible I can get behind. 
it's there, there, at some point in the future I may revisit those as a, like a long road to ruin or something. Those uh, are the two. Isn't it romantic? And then uh, Alita Battle Angel comes out on Valentine's Day. We'll be doing a damn you Hollywood. We'll be, yeah, we'll be doing a damn you Hollywood review of that. And then Man, finally, who thought that was a good idea? Uh, we'll actually have a guest. The trailer for that, like this is going to be a mess. And so we'll actually have somebody on the show who uh, who's familiar with the manga that it was based on. So that'll be fun. All right, so that's that's really it. Um, and we, and I bring all that up to say, you know, I don't know. Glass doesn't have great word of mouth on it. I mean, basically what I told people is don't listen to me and my opinion on Glass. Go see it for yourself and judge for yourself. Because I'm, I'm somewhat prejudiced. I don't particularly like the Shyamalan way of doing things, let alone his movies. I'd so, be curious to see what you think of Signs in particular, because... Apparently it scared the shit out of my wife to the point where she couldn't sleep when she first saw it. Hey, it freaked me. It freaked teenage me out when I saw it the first time. Something about aliens, man. It, 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 there's, I don't know. I, I don't understand. Like, there's a bunch of my fear buttons that I understand. Like, oh, this scares me. I know exactly why I'm afraid of this. <sighs> I do not understand why. What part of me, you know, some of that stuff is you know punching in the face on occasion. But <laughs> all right, uh, let's move on down. He's on down the road here. Guess what? I have a question for you, Mr. Winfrey. Are you ready? No! I said, are you ready? No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 All right, we've got roughly. Uh, well, this was, this was more negative. This was more rotten than it was fresh. So, we've got quite a number of these to go through here. So let's get to it. Um, Sharon Nicole of Adobe dot com. I liked it, but ultimately Glass needed an editor, someone to dial it back, give it focus, and help to find the true life moments that make good comics and good comic book movies work. Uh, again, there's some I think that again, I think that's a largely fair assessment. I also think that part of the that statement at the end about what makes comic book movies work I think not go I, again, if this is a like and it's not a deconstruction in the traditional sense of deconstructionism, but it is a very different, again, like meta, self-aware take on it, and I don't think you want too much. You, know, you don't want you know the people who routinely edit the Marvel stuff to edit this because I think they give it the, they would give it the wrong sense. Yeah, uh, Louisa Moore of Screen Zealots, a long-winded, thinly premised, half-baked mess of a movie. It appears Shyamalan has both given up and run out of steam. I imagine this person positively reviewed Split. And I don't say that as a negative, but there's a lot of very... I don't understand too many people who have a very disparate sense of those two movies. If I, like, if you liked Split, I don't understand what your major objections would be to this one. I'm going to read these next two back-to-back. Michael Ward of Should I Seen It? Should I See It? And then... Matt Oaks of Silver Screen Riot. Shattered. Broken. Cracked. Insert whichever pun you choose. Personally, this is one piece of glass I won't want to be looking at ever again. And if you think that's funny... I don't. The glass, quote-unquote, is half empty in a laughably bad ending to the Shyamalan trilogy. Yeah, this isn't laughably bad. I mean, again, if you don't like it, that's fine. But again, if you want laughably bad, you have both Avatar The Last Airbender and The Happening, if you're just loosely sticking with Shyamalan's filmography for a moment. Those are so bad, you can't help but laugh. I don't think there's a lot of laughter to be had in it. Again, even if you didn't like it, this isn't so bad. This does not strain to so bad it's funny territory at any point. Predictable, yes, again, if you're paying attention. It's horribly telegraphed. That's not the same thing. Johnny Gazemonic, fanboys of the universe. What's frustrating beyond Shyamalan's inordinate fascination with his own work and his precious final act twists 
is that there really is nobody to root for in Glass. I what? I, I don't think really. You root minute, for Bruce Willis. So so you're not rooting. So not only you're not rooting for Bruce Willis, you're also not rooting for the genuine personality of Kevin, who they t- who, and they don't again they don't go into huge detail here, but who was horribly abused to the point of developing unbelievably debilitating dissociative identity disorder. You don't root for that guy to have a happy ending? Again, the Beast? No, sure, you don't root for the Beast. He kills people. Fair enough. But it's also abundantly clear that he is an aspect of this other person who is just desperately trying to deal with the pain that life has thrown at him. I'm sorry, if you can't root for that on some level then I question your connection to humanity. And bear in mind, I do question my, my own connection to humanity daily. But Gen- it's, no, like, you're incredibly wrong about all of that. I mean, in a somewhat bizarre... And again, like, I don't disagree that Shyamalan has a bit of a fascination with his own work. That's probably true. I would slightly object to the notion that this is one of those Shyamalan twist endings... Because this, I mean, this literally, this type of stuff happened all the time in comics well before Shyamalan made movies. If you're talking and very explicitly dealing in material that does twists like this all the time, see things like, hey, the Secret Wars, or Captain America was a Hydra sympathizer all along. This crap happens all the time in the media that it that it is referencing. Of course it's going to do it. That doesn't mean this is one of those Shyamalan twists. I, th- I think you're radically mischaracterizing it. Jennifer Heaton on of Alternative Lens. I wish Glass were either much better or much worse than it is. It is neither a satisfying conclusion to a trilogy nor an entertainingly bad disaster. It's just kind of dull. Yeah, I can see that. That's that's pretty fair. Uh, we may have to cut this in a minute. I'm starting to go here. Um, but, 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 let's see. If, if any of our friends wait in here, come on, Joe Morgenstein. <laughs> Not Morgenstern. I can't deal with old man Morgenstern today. I just want to kill him. I want to find him and like throw hard boiled eggs at his head. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. I, I, I want to find a. I want to find like that three-day-old pie, you know, at the pie store, the one that's old and crusty. I right, hear we pie go. Pie him in the face. With it. Jeremy Johns of JeremyJohns dot com. Self-employed loser. When your third act falls apart, that's what people are going to remember, and I feel that's what happened here. See, I don't think the third act falls apart. I mean, if anything, the big critiques aimed at this movie should be aimed at the metal. Yeah, I would say the third act is where it is when something actually happens. Hang on, really quick. Sarah Mars of Laney Gossip, the glass is half empty. Boy, if I had a nickel for every one time you hacks, use, the, use that phrase. Uh, you know what? Phrase. To all the people who wrote that, I mean, look, I get low-hanging fruit. You all just sat under the tree opened your mouth and decided, you know what, I'm going to wait for this. I'm not even going to reach for it. It's going to have to fall to me. <laughs> I am so... De- you are that, uh, what, the character from the Shel Silverstein poem, who gets thirsty but is so lazy she just waits outside for it to rain. That's you people and your quality of writing. Chris Evangelista slash film. Like Superman exposed to kryptonite, directing Glass has robbed Shyamalan of his powers. No, really? Like, you're not going to point out the infinitely worse movies that he's created? I, that, that statement makes no sense. Like, why would you reach for that metaphor if you don't actually have a conclusion to it? <laughs> Rohan Nashar of the Hindustan Times. Bruce Willis, once the biggest movie star on the planet, has been made out to surrender top billing, and Shyamalan, once the path-breaking genius is now offering meta-commentary on not only comic books and comic book culture, but also, strangely, his career. Okay. Minor note. When did Shyamalan ever break ground? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean this in all sincerity. 
the he's dead all along thing, he didn't create that. Right. Are you unfamiliar with film history, you <laughs> moron? Uh... And second of all, of course... I mean, you mentioned that Bruce Willis was at one point one of the biggest box office stars in the country, in the world, sure. You know who the highest gro- who has been in the... Do you know whose career... Again, like, this is weird to say it this way, but Samuel L. Jackson is the highest grossing actor of all time. If you look at the movies he has been in, he is the highest grossing actor. I'm going to end with this one. He and Harrison Ford actually have swapped it back and forth a few times. We're going to end with this one. I think this one's very insightful. I think there's a lot to digest here and a lot to say. When you set me up like that, man. (laughs) And I feel like this particular person really earns her star as top critic. Mara Reinstein of U.S. Weekly. Oh, God, why? I see disappointed people. Really? (laughs) <laughs> Any other... Po- uh, you didn't want to throw a Weakest Link in- reference in there? How about a... This is like... You know, I'm the king of the... Any other pop culture references you really want to reach at the peak of their... <laughs> at the at the, at the peak of their popularity there, lady? <laughs> oh, boy, it gets better. Eric Eisenberg of Cinema Blend. The conclusion of this film is a worse disaster than East Rail 177. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean... A, one's an actual train wreck. One is... I mean, again, one is one is a train wreck. One is telegraphed. That's not the same thing. Oh, no, I can't believe they killed my char- They killed characters. I mean, what, what media are you consuming where you're unfamiliar with character death? Roger Moore of Movie Nation, Robert Winfrey's spiritual father. Oh, I hate this man so much. A watchable but self-serious and pointless dissection of the comic book genre. I mean, of course it's kind of self-serious. Like, have you not seen Shyamalan's work? The happening would be better if it were at least quasi-tongue-in-cheek or or intended to be so bad it's good. Hey, Robert. Yes? Knock, knock. Who's there? It's Joe Morgenstern of the Wall God. Street Journal. <laughs> oh, no. Not old man Morgenstern. I'd rather talk to a Jehovah's Witness. The concept is intriguing, but the emotional payoff is negligible. The surprise ending is feeble, and the whole enterprise resembles a recycling bin. Now okay. get off my lawn. Let, let's, let's deal with a couple of these. Old man, l- Look, Grandpa, sit down for a minute. you got to take your pills. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'll give you the emotions a little bit flat. That's... They probably could have... Especially if you haven't seen the preceding movies, there's not... You don't get a lot of the emotional payoff. That's that's fair. But any time you take a meta or a again quasi-deconstructionist view of material, of course everything you, you, you talk about is going to seem familiar... I mean, that's like watching Austin Powers and going, boy, this sure seems like a recycled James Bond film, doesn't it? I mean, duh! (laughs) Alright, this is the last one. Ready? Okay. This is a top critic, by the way. Mick LaSalle. How do these people get this? Uh, In all seriousness, what are the qualifications for top critic? how effectively you can blow one of the editors at Rotten Tomatoes. Mick LaSalle of San Francisco Chronicle. No, no, Rotten Tomatoes doesn't have editors. They're just an aggregate. Worst movie of 2019. Not even close. Hold on. (laughs) Hold on. (laughs) It's not right at all. You had to do it. You just had to say it. (laughs) So I have to look at it. So I'm going to look. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So we have, again, we haven't had a whole lot released yet. You really going to say this is worse than Escape Room? I mean, I like <laughs> horror movies, but really? I mean, A Dog's Way Home is nothing but pulpy schlock. Replicas is... Really? You think this is worse than Replicas, which is just like Keanu Reeves? 
It's Keanu Reeves, like talking to Keanu Reeves. It's Keanu. <laughs> you you have like this might be the worst movie of 2019 because it's the only movie from this year you've seen. All right, I think that uh, we've reached our conclusion here. That's actually it for the month of January. Again, we'll be back in February with another damn you Hollywood for Alita Battle Angel. But if you why like... is Jake Gyllenhaal a thing? Someone explain this to me. He and I say this simply because uh, sorry, this might seem apropos of nothing. But I'm looking over February because Mark went through some of it, so I was curious what else shows up there. And there's a Netflix movie called Velvet Buzzsaw starring Jake Gyllenhaal, and I can't help but wonder. You see, Jake Gyllenhaal is a very capable actor. Um, this is not a knock on his acting, and he was also in the trailer for... Because he's going to be, uh, what, Mesmero or something for Spider-Man Far From Home? Mysterio. Whatever. They're all the same. Racist. Look. Look. Hang on. <laughs> you're a, you're a quasi-mystical comic book villain specifically related to Spider-Man and your name starts with an M, you're all the same. And I defy you to prove me wrong. I don't understand why you hate Mexicans. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> Ray Mysterio, Mysterio, the... never mind. Um, can, can hey, we... Hang on. So, hey, my point there is Jake Gyllenhaal, while a very capable actor, is in the worst movies you could possibly be in. <laughs> Like I wish I could see him I could see Jake Gyllenhaal attached to a movie and go, "Oh, I can watch Jake Gyllenhaal act." That because he's a good actor. But instead, I look at it and go, "This man makes the worst career decisions possible." <laughs> and yet still retains a, you know, not a, a relatively A-list billing. But I I know that his involvement is usually a mark against the entire movie, not because he's bad, but because of what it says about the movie generally. And I don't know how he has survived all of that. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, if you've enjoyed my the banter between Robert Winfrey and myself, you won't have to wait too long, because even though we're not doing another Game You Hollywood until... Uh, February 19th. We still have Voltron Season 8, which is February 5th, and Punisher oh, yeah. Season 2, which is February 12th. So, uh, there's all that. What? Oh, God. Both of them were disappointing in very different ways and for very different reasons. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, let's talk about this week. Tomorrow on the Metal Hammer... Googly. Uh, tomorrow on the Metal Hammer of Doom, we'll be looking at the new Papa Roach, Who Do You Trust?, and then, it's, and then Mr. Toxic mas Masculinity is everywhere you look. He's Pat Mullen, and he's going to be joining me not only to discuss Season 4 of Fuller House, but he'll also be doing a live... Robert Winfrey has abandoned the, uh, <laughs> the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network, and he took the 401 Ground and Pound radio show with him. Uh, so now that is the exclusive property of 401 Mania. So we said, well, fuck Robert Winfrey. We'll just do our own thing. So we're going to go ahead and do live commentary of Thurman versus Lopez, which is uh, live boxing on Fox, Fox proper, at 8 p.m. So give that a whirl. You get to hear me and Pat do more commentary, which I'm sure will end with Pat saying, boxing is terrible, and I quit. Uh, <clears throat> we'll follow that up February 2nd with Ser Sergey Kovalev versus Elater uh, Alvarez, which will be on uh, ESPN, uh, I believe... Wait, 10 p.m., full card streaming on ESPN+. ESPN Plus. Oh, I don't have ESPN+. Plus. That may, that might not be happening anymore. Wait, which part? It says uh, the full card is streaming on ESPN+, Plus beginning at 7 p.m. For this, what? For Sergey Kovalev versus a later Al Alvarez. Mm. I'll check um, all those things on that one. Oh, God. I don't want to say anything that could get either of us in legal trouble. Mm -hmm. But you have the internet. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll 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 talk about stealing later. <laughs> uh, one Sorry, sir. I, again, I don't condone stealing, but sure. I just, again, this is one of those things I have to, anytime someone goes, and, and again, to anytime someone says something like that, I wind up, I just kind of like, I roll my eyes a little bit because 
I cannot. I know you're not naive enough to think that there aren't other options. If you're moral enough to resist them, I absolutely applaud you. And I do. No, you don't. <laughs> um, I real quick, really, really, really quick. Jesse Starcher has never seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail yet. What we the reference, hell? Yeah, I know. Yet we reference it all the time, and so it's finally on Netflix. We are going to strap Jesse to a chair Friday night. And we're going to make him watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and we'll do a uh, live commentary over that. So that'll be it fun. Is, Monty Python and one of the Holy Grail is the best movies ever. It's up there. Uh, the following week, it's Runaways. We've got a Runaways on source material. We've got Runaways Season 2 on TV Party Tonight. Pale Horse Named Death on the Metal Hammer of Doom. And The Crown Season 2 is in the aforementioned Boxing on February 2nd. Uh, February 4th is a search for Ray Palmer, Voltron, then Bring Me the Horizon, and then the next on trial will be February 7th, and it'll be for Pan's Labyrinth. Uh, the question was asked, what could you possibly say to prosecute this? I don't know. I've never seen the movie. I guess we'll find out. Which um, movie are you prosecuting? Pan's Labyrinth. I mean, look, I can tell you how you will prosecute it. <laughs> okay. How dare there be dialogue? <laughs> How dare there be dialogue I can't understand? And why do, I, I hate reading subtitles. This is the worst. None of that's and, true. I'm fine with subtitles. And why is everything done practically? I want I want shinies. I want computer generated imagery, not this <sighs> very talented actor in a suit. Okay, you go ahead and eat a dick. I'll be just fine, thanks. Um, no, I, I, in all seriousness, like joking aside, that is. Pan's Labyrinth is one of the most is one of those rare like essentially perfect movies oh then it'll be fun to poke holes in it uh, we've got the Punisher Max Volume 5 The Slavers on source material then Punisher Season 2 on February 12th Beast in Black February 13th we're off of Valentine's Day and then uh, nothing on Friday and then Pat and I are back for Leo Santa Cruz versus Miguel Flores which will be uh, on Fox and more live commentary. Uh, we've got uh, Alexis Haina will be back for DC Looney Tunes 2. And then Damn You Hollywood Alita Battle Angel February 19th. We'll welcome you back to Avantasia on February 20th. And then again, Alexis Haina will make her second shot that week as we'll be reviewing Carmen Sandiego, the new animated series from Netflix. And we finish off the month with Emerald Twilight, Black Mirror, Bandersnatch, and Dream Theater, because my life is terrible. Dream Theater sucks. Actually, no. Dream Theater is fine. I just All of those are pretty bad. Not a huge fan of Dream Theater, i got to be honest with you. I, I, I don't think any of those are any good. <laughs> good. All right. That's it. That's all I have to say about that. That's all i got to say about that. Uh, all right. As for myself, I was back in the MMA Zone of 411mania.com a couple of days ago for UFC Fight Night 143 slash UFC on ESPN Plus One. And I'm going to continue making bad jokes about ESPN about the UFC on ESPN and their polyamory. Because apparently they're going with the naming scheme of Plus One, Plus Two, Plus Three, Plus Four. Whatever. And how many pluses do you need, guys? <laughs> Again, I'm going to continue with it. Uh, so you can check out my full report for that event. We had stupid controversy in the co-main event because someone scripted it that way, and I don't mean in that in the sense that it was fixed. I mean that if you if you were to sit down and like, okay, we have Greg Hardy debuting in the <laughs> UFC. What's the like? What's the dumbest, most perfect thing we could do? Him getting disqualified for landing an illegal knee after having a bad fight for seven minutes. That's what it would be, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, also, again, the main event, Henry Cejudo done rolled over TJ Dillashaw like a steamroller. Um, that was funny as hell to watch. And then TJ after the fact. Who, TJ's still undefeated in his own mind. <laughs> uh, no, no. The ref stopped the Dodson fight early. The ref stopped this fight early. I don't know how they scored the first fight for Austin Sow. I don't know how they scored that fight for Cruz. I'm the best ever. I want an immediate rematch back at flyweight. Gimme, 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 gimme. That is TJ Delashaw. A man after midnight. You know, Stuart Lang uh, posted on Twitter after something, after something TJ said, shut up, skinny Owen Wilson, and I can't unsee it. 
I, I cannot unsee that comparison. It's hilarious. Because I also hate Owen Wilson. He's so bad. But you can, anyway, so check out my full report of that. Again, the latest edition of the 411 Ground and Pound Radio Show, where we go over all the fights from that card. Uh, we also talk about all the major news of the last week in MMA. Uh, I get to gush about Gagey versus Barboza because I one of them is going to die. Those two are going to kill each other, and I can't wait. So, again, you can check out all of that. Um, speaking of 411, Mark will be in the Factor Fiction segment for in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania this week. So give that a read. Vote for who you think won, not Mark. Uh, I kid, I kid. Seriously, vote for who you think won, whether that's Mark or the other guy. Who is the other guy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, also, a new thing that's come up, I think, over the last couple of weeks that I'm going to be doing. Uh, my Fridays, which were previously free, are now not, apparently, for the near future. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Larry Zonka, again, one of the bosses over at 411, who shouldered a workload comparable to, like, eight other human beings, mind you. He's uh, he's indisposed for the moment. I he's posted about it on Twitter. I don't want to go into details, but he's out for the, he's out for a while. And we now so the site has been kind of like trying to find eight other people to do the workload of one Larry Zonka. And this uh, a section of that fell on me. Well, it fell on me the first time. The fact that I volunteered for it ongoing because I'm a nice guy. Here's my question: Is this going to affect? Countdown to Endgame, which we have scheduled for Fridays in April. Uh, yeah. It, it might. <laughs> what are you doing? And wh What are you doing? And tell me when I have to cancel this countdown series that you pitched. Hang on. I don't... Uh, again, it's April, so it's enough time It's enough time in advance. I might not have to. I can probably work around it. I'm going to be covering Impact Wrestling. Oh, God, why? Because it drives traffic. Are you fucking serious? Look, they sent it, again, like, all the... we get, There was an email that was sent out saying, here's the stuff that... Here's some stuff we want covered live. Here's stuff that we're happy to have just reports on after the fact. We could really use someone covering Impact. It has a... It has a fan base. It has, you know, people that tune in. Again, it's so... If someone could, and I wound up doing it a couple of weeks ago on short notice, because, I mean, Jeremy Thomas just messaged me kind of out of the blue and said, we need someone to cover Impact. Are you free this evening? And you know it streams free on Twitch. And I went, yeah, sure, why not? I proceeded to then piss off, like, everyone who everyone who was reading along and, like, commenting, because I hadn't watched any professional wrestling in, like, five years. So was there a lot of who the fuck is that guy? No, there was a lot. I either... There were a lot of people that I knew, and bear in mind, when I say any professional wrestling, and that's like weekly, reliable stuff. I watched a fair amount of Lucha Under. I binged a fair amount of Lucha Underground a few, you know, like th uh, two or three years ago. I binged a fair amount of that, so I knew a lot of the main players there. Uh, I had wa I, the last thing I remember watching on Impact, which was then TNA, was Nigel McGinnis's debut because I like I loved Nigel's work, and. Bear in mind, that also includes, like, all things WWE-related, just hadn't seen. And I said this at the top of the thing. It's like, okay, for there's a lot of people who are going to show up whose faces I don't know. A lot of my pro wrestling knowledge at this point is osmotic. And apparently this makes me a WWE mark. <laughs> uh, so there was that. That's uh, fucking at point, hilarious. Like, so... I mean, at this point, like part of the reason I think, you know what, this might be amusing is just to see how much they, how much they all can't stand me at this point. So we'll see. Um, but Impact is also, it's only two hours. It's like I think it's like six to eight my time. So I might again. I I will, if I if if no if no other solution has presented itself in a few months when that comes up. I might very well just tell them you guys don't pay me enough for this when I have something else I'd rather be doing. Okay. So we'll again we'll see. I am I will do everything in my power to make sure that I can still go through with that because I'm looking forward to that series. But you also don't pay me enough either. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that said, it's it, thanks. It's, 
<laughs> Thanks for putting up with us, everybody. Uh, glad you're all still here in 2019. Uh, we're looking forward to it in a lot of respects here on the Ride Election Broadcasting Network. Again, we have a fair amount of Damn You Hollywood lined up, which should be a lot of fun. We have a new tagline, by the way. So it's, it's, we're no longer, when you sign off, we're no longer saying uh, be well, be safe, and behave. Our new tagline is we look forward to offending you in the future. Well, on behalf of Mark, I'm Robert. <laughs> we're grateful to have offended you in the past and look forward to offending you in the future. Stay safe, everybody. Say you just bought a house. Bad news is, you're one step closer to becoming your parents. You'll proudly mow the lawn. Ask if anybody noticed you mowed the lawn. Tell people to stay off the lawn. Compare it to your neighbor's lawn. And complain about having to mow the lawn again. Good news is, it's easy to bundle home and auto through Progressive and save on your car insurance. Which, of course, will go right into the lawn. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company, affiliates, and other insurers. Discount not available in all stages or situations. I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, America's premier home purchase lender. Today's fluctuating interest rates can leave you with unexpected higher mortgage payments. At Quicken Loans, we've created a new way to protect you from unpredictable interest rates so you can buy a home with certainty. It's called Rate Shield, and here's how it works. With Rate Shield, you can lock your interest rate while you shop for a new home. So if rates go up, you don't have to worry. And here's the best part. If rates go down, you get the lower rate. With Rate Shield, we really have you covered. Here are more reasons why you'll want to work with America's largest mortgage lender. For nine years in a row now, J.D. Power has ranked Quicken Loans highest in the nation in customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination. And for the fifth year in a row, they've also ranked us highest in the nation for mortgage servicing. Rate Shield. Another way we can save you money on your mortgage. Call us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com. Based on Rocket Mortgage data in comparison to public data records, rate shield approval only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender license in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply.